So will you pick up the mantle? This is part five of our series. And since we began this series, I repeated many, many times the story of Elisha's call as so many uh, lessons for us. It's such an important message for us. Because there is one scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that God says he is the one who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. So that text is addressed to the church at large, all of us. Paul is talking to the Thessalonians. This is a New Testament text, and we read that God has saved us. Can you say us? us. God saved us and called us, us to a, with a holy calling. So are you included in the us this morning? Yes. Oh, that's clear. That's clear. Hallelujah. So let's see, let's see that part of that verse and the I part. He saved me, and He called me with a holy calling. Can we say that together this morning? He saved me, and He called me with a holy calling. Hallelujah. So that makes it very clear to all of us. And here in this text, just as a way of review, because we want, I, I want to close that series, so I want to come back to this uh, text that we, we're looking. When we talk about understanding our calling, God calls us first to know Him through the message of salvation and to enter into a connection with Him, to know the Lord through His Word, to know the Lord. And uh, God calls us also to live for Him. So this is what the calling is doing to us. And we saw that at many times in the New Testament, the calling to know God is repeated more than 40 times, and calling to live for Him comes also more than 20 times and many, many texts. And that definition that we have looked at, I think that is gripping for us, calling, can you read it with me, please? Calling is the deep conviction that God calls us to Himself so decisively that everything we are, everything we do, and everything we have is invested and lived out with devotion as a response to His directive and service. So that is what we've ta been talking about in that series, and we give a lot of practical um, application to that. Slide number three, this is also review. We've been looking at all of these lessons, listed the seven points here, and today we are finishing with points number seven. So I don't want to review it so much because we've been spending so much time on that. So last week we finished with point number six, how Elisha was so quick to respond with total surrender. He burned uh, the yoke, the, the, uh, his instruments of work, he kills his animals, offered the sacrifice and followed e Elijah immediately. Very, very total surrender. No turning back, no going back to your job. You know, when God called me to move to Hong Kong, at first, I, I, I told you before in the, in the sermon and uh, uh, repeatedly, I had a one-year faith I believe that God could send me to Hong Kong for one year. So we came here for one year. That God could support me financially for one year. So we came here. So we were going to keep our house. And I was, as I was planning to move to Hong Kong to be a mission for one year, I was planning, in the back of my mind, to go back to Canada, go back to my church, go back to being a pastor. That's how I was going to to, to see my future because I had a one-year faith. That faith had not yet been, you know, developed so much, but that, that's something. But here we see that Elisha burned the bridge, which actually we did also because at first we were supposed to rent our home so that we would have some place to go back. But then, uh, anyway, that's to make a short story, we, we, we sold the house and we believed that God, who had given us this house, was removing it from us so that we could focus, so that we could be set free and live totally to the new place that we, we were going to, to go to, to serve Him. So Elijah did something like that. He sold everything in a way of speaking. He, he let it behind and he believed that God was calling him to be the prophet that would replace the great Elijah the prophet. 
And uh, we talked last week about the first part of his equipping, because uh, point number uh, seven here says he was specially equipped and enabled to, uh, by God to fulfill his calling. So when God calls, he equips. He will provide everything that you will ever need to fulfill his calling. Otherwise, it would not make sense. God will never call you to do something big and if he doesn't provide all the supernatural help and everything that goes. So last week we talked about it and the first part of his equipping was to spend seven to eight years to be Elijah's assistant. And I, I gave some illustrations of that last week. But I want to look at two scriptures quickly to show the importance of the foundation of faith that all Christians should receive. When you receive the call to come to God, and when you receive the call of the gospel. If you look at Romans chapter uh, 6, verse 17, slide number 4, but thank God that through, though you were once slaves of sin, you became obedient from your hearts that, to that form of teaching with which you were entrusted. I want to bring your attention in that text. You used to be in sin, enslaved to sin, servant of sins. But even though that was the state you were in, through the calling that we have received in Christ, something was changed. We became conformed to something else. There are two expressions here in this verse I want to draw your attention. You became obedient. And if you look at the Greek text, very interesting, it's like you hear under. What you have heard from the Word of God, you submitted yourself under that authority. And I think that is very crucial because many people hear the same sermons, will be exposed to the same Bible teaching, one grows, the other one doesn't. What, how do you explain it? One hear and come under what he hears. He let the power, the authority of God win. I am submitting to that. The other one just here and it, it goes on the other way. So that's very important to listen under, to submit to the authority of what you hear. Think about yourself so far. How are you doing in that? When you hear the word of God, the sermon, do you let the, the authority of what you hear confront you, shock you, convict you, and change you that you will really make a change out of it. And you will repent out of, of your bad attitude when the word of God visits you and confronts you. Or are you just listening and leaving this room untransformed after that? That's up to you. But if you want to be uh, the kind of Elisha, if you want to God to lead you to a more fulfilling and more anointing and more impact, then you will need to listen under like this. And the second expression is to the form of teaching or the form of, of, uh, of uh, doctrine here. And the word is tupos. It's like a mold. It's like when you listen to the word of God, the word of God, the authority of the word of God, it's like it apply a pressure onto your whole life that is being conformed, becoming conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. There's a type, the doctrines of Christianity, the, 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 when you hear about the godliness or the Christ-likeness, and if you submit to that, it will uh, lead you to a conformity. There will be like a mold, a shape will take place, and you will re start to resemble more and more to, to the shape the original shape of Jesus Christ, the model of, of our life and faith. So that's very important. When the Christian doctrine is pressed upon obedient hearts, hearts who come under what we hear from the Word of God, you, your heart will, will kind of melt like a metal, melted metals that will fit in a mold and a conforming will take place. A process of becoming like this. So Elisha had this process taken place in his life when he immediately followed Elijah and became his assistant for seven and eight years. Then we look at the second uh, scriptures here. We, we sit in the, in the relationship between Paul and Timothy. Uh, Timothy, you know everything about me. 
you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my goals, my faith, my long suffering, my patience, my, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions, my suffering. You, you knew it. You have seen. You have carefully followed. You've studied. You have observed me. You have walked along with me. So new believers or Christians, we, we need to, to fit in that uh, attitude of our faith to let the Word of God and the, the mold and the likeness of Jesus Christ guide us to become what we need to become. Why do we come every Sunday to church? It's not only to hear the Word, it's to be impacted, it's to be transformed. You know, I, I read before when we used to have the training for inductive Bible study here. The goal of Bible studies is a transformed life. If this is not achieved, then whatever information you have gained through that sermon or that study is useless. It has to lead to a transformed life, an obedient life, a life that follow after the goals that Christ has for us. Please say amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And don't say amen because I say please say amen. <laughs> Just say amen because you also believe it or something. Hallelujah. Like some, some, some sort of agreement. <laughs> because if I say hey, please, please. Okay. So, sorry. I would try not to say please next time. <laughs> Hallelujah. I just want to be, try to be polite. Hallelujah. Okay. So last week we started to look at next slide. Uh, this is the, the part I think to do, we are going on. We talk about Elisha was equipped by God but he was enabled enabled to fulfill his, his calling. The, the supernatural enablement, this is an incredible story. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's so supernatural. Hallelujah. So when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. They've been walking together seven to eight years. They have, must have developed such a, a relationship uh, of heart. Two men of God. They're not only like buddies, but they are men of God. They are called by God. They are under the authority of God. So that, mu that must affect their speech, their conversation. Think about it. But the, that, that kind of relationship. Okay. So Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. Elisha says, Double affirmation. We looked at it last week. No way and no way. Okay? Or I'm going to and I'm going to. Double affirmation. As the Lord lives, I'm going with you. And as you yourself live, I'm going with you. Double affirmation. I will not leave you. So they went down to a battle. So and we said last week, Elisha is such a hungry uh, man for God. He doesn't want to miss anything. And we said last week, and I want to repeat it again, how much of God's fullness and anointing are we missing in our lives. Think about it, Christian. God has everything for us. He has prepared everything. We are His masterpiece. He has so much for us and all of His promises. And because we are not asking, because we are careless or we are not thirsty or hungry for more, we are just let it pass us. How much are we missing? Think about it. How much are we missing of the best of God by our lack of thirst and hunger and desire that we may have? But not Elisha. As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. I want everything. I want the full package. I want everything. So we saw that. Go to the, uh, slide number six. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? And look at the answer from Elisha. Of course I know. Of course I know. But be quiet about it. Don't, don't disturb me. Don't trouble me. Don't make me lose my, my desire. Don't, don't put me down with that. Then Elisha said to Elisha, stay here for the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. From Bethel, now they are going, they start in Gilgal, they go to Bethel, and they go from Bethel, they go to Jericho, and from Jericho they will go to Jerusalem. And Bethel and Gilgal, they had a school of prophets, and Bethel, they had school of prophets, and in Jericho, they had school of prophets. So keep that in mind because that's important. Elijah 
is living. He's been the prophet, the anointed prophet, the, the, the key prophet during the years that he was there. He is visiting, and I'm not sure I understand exactly why, but it seems, according to the studies I've made, that he is visiting each place where uh, schools of prophets were established because he cares for them. He's going away, and he's visiting, he's visiting with them. So stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. But Elisha replied again, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together to Jericho. They reached, they reached Jericho. Then a group of prophets from Jericho. There was a group of prophets in Bethel. Now there's another one from Jericho. They came to Elisha. And then this is repeated again. The same thing over and over. So that's why I, I skipped that, the, some, some scriptures. But the same kind of conversation. Do you know that your master is going to take it? The Lord is taking him away today? Yes, I know, but don't talk about it. And we, we find that again. So verse 6. So they went on together. They go on. And then, but something different here, 50 men from Jericho, 50 prophets from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance. They followed these two men of God. They're going. The prophets know that Eli Elijah is going to take, uh, be taken away. Elisha knows that his master is going to be taken away. So th they follow at a distance from Jericho to the Jordan uh, River. Then they reach the river, and Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. We don't know why Elijah asked Elisha to stay in Gilgal, or to stay in Bethel, or to stay in Jordan when he was away. We, we said that last week. I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry. But pay attention to the different groups of prophets. They knew that Elijah was going to be taken away. Bethel, Jericho, and they asked the same questions many times. Did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? And Elisha knew, but didn't let it uh, make him lose his focus. Elisha sensed that he had to be there. And there is something to learn about this also in our lives. If you want to follow God and go further with God, you will have to have this sense of abiding this sense of continuing, this sense that you need to be obedient, the sense that you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to be in tune with God. You will need to have this sense. Because if you don't have this sense, you will, you know what will happen? Do you know your, your master is going to take away? Oh, is that, is that going to be away? Okay, so what's the point of following anymore? Let, let me stay here then. Why not? Oh, stay here while I'm going there. Okay, I'll stay here. You, you see opportunities missed here? If you don't have the little inner voice of the Holy Spirit, that prompting from the Holy Spirit, that sense that I must go continue. I must not miss that event. I must not miss being with my, my master or the one that is training me or whatever it is. H how we can apply it in our life. But there is a place for a sense of continuing, a sense of thirst and to, to continue. If we don't have that, we will miss. Imagine this, that story would have a, a, such a different ending if Elisha says, okay, I'm staying here. Y you see the point? Yes? Brother Stephen, see the point. Okay, thank you, Brother Stephen. Okay. If you decide, each one of you individually, that you are going after God, you make a decision, you've been touched by the Holy Spirit, and you, I'm going to go further with the Lord. And if you decide, I'm going to pay the price, and I'm going to seek a greater anointing, be sure of one thing. There will be people that will do their best to talk you out of it. Not because they are evil, just because it's like that. It, it's just people who say, are you sure? Uh, don't go. Maybe it's not worthy. Uh, are you not ready? Uh, don't go there. Don't do this. Or They, they will have uh, uh, different things. Uh, I remember when, when I, God called me to come to China. I had been a pastor for a number of years in Canada. Pastor Jennifer uh, knows that, and I told mom and dad when I came. I was part of the Assemblies of God in Canada. 
And uh, I, I had done many, many projects. I was a director for the youth, uh, for all the churches. I had raised a lot of money with the youth activities. I had been to the uh, mission headquarters. I, had, you know, I, I knew th all the, 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 the great leaders of our organizations. And then when I announced that I was going to come to Hong Kong, and join an organization at the time, I didn't know Lighthouse, the time it was before that, that was going to take uh, Bibles into China. And uh, that's, that's what I believe that God was calling me to do. At first they didn't object, and then after that, they started to call me in, and they says, oh, no, we don't want you to go there. And I said, but God is calling me to go. But he says, oh, because we have other works there, and we are afraid that if you are arrested at the borders or something, that it will uh, jeopardize other uh, projects that we have. So we advise you not to go. But I says, well, it's in my heart. God already convicted me uh, that I need to go. So they, they wrote a letter to me. They, we, I met two times at the air uh, quarters. And they really told me, well, if, if you would go, we would allow you to, to go. If you would do something else, like uh, be, be in the church but not uh, uh, smuggling Bibles, if you do that, we are not supporting you. It's strange, isn't it? But that's what happened to me at the time. But I says, this is what God did not ask me to do something else. He asked me to join this and to do this work. This is what God spoke into my heart. So finally, I received a letter, an official letter, and that says, uh, well, we advise you not to go. But however, if you choose to go, please do not mention that you had credentials with our organizations anymore. So that's how it, it end up being. You can go, but you will not be with us. We cut you off from, from us. Imagine if I would have said, okay, not going. I would not have met you. You would not have met me. That would be so sad. What would have happened to our life? God had a, a calling on my life. But, I mean, these were godly people, and I respect them, and I have a good relationship, because later on, they saw the fruit that I was bearing here, and then they called me in and says, tell us about your ministry. <laughs> and now they are very happy to associate themselves with, with, with me and all this, and I have a full access to that. But at first, the same people says, no, you cannot go. You could if you would do something else. And uh, Elisha is, is in the same category here. Amen? Amen. So Elisha asked, something here. Elijah, let us go to the next slide. Elijah folded his cloak together, or his mantle, struck the water with it, the river divided, and the two of them went across on dry ground. You know, they were standing on the side of the Jordan River, so what are we going to do now? When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elijah said, please, let there be a double portion of your spirit. Wonderful. Then he said, you have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be done so for you. If you do not see me, it shall not be so. There are three words in this text here. This is a wonderful, this is the, the, the main turning point of that story. Ask Number one is double portion. Number three is it's a hard thing. And now think, think about yourself and the call of God and the things that you could be doing for the Lord and the thing that God has for you and, and your life. Why do you think Elijah asked, uh, Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you? Not sure, we may have different uh, answer to that question. Wh why do you, I is it because they became a very close friend? Is it because uh, I'm going away, so ask me uh, my, ha my house, I'm going to give you my house. I don't know if he had one, maybe not. Uh, ask me my money, I'm giving you my money or something, ask me something, I don't, I don't know. Or was it God really uh, be, uh, leading the mind of Elijah to ask that to Elisha, to, to have him uh, confess his faith or express what is in his heart? You know, God has asked uh, Solomon, the king, what, what do you want? And then he says, I want wisdom. He says, and God 
God commanded him because you did not ask for money and gold and power and you know I will give you all of, of that of the above so so here we have something similar to that and also I believe that making our request to God is very important if you look at the New Testament you will find so many places where Jesus invites us to make known our request. Paul says this, make known your request to God with thanksgiving and, and don't doubt James says it, Jesus says it, all the apostles uh, said, ask and it shall, you shall receive. Ask in my name, I will do whatever you ask in my name. And there's so many examples. Okay, now, you, are you here? Yeah. Yes. yes. If God would ask you this question right now, ask what I shall do for you what would be the nature of your request or would you have one you know sometimes when we have a prayer request together I just uh, something comes to my mind it says anybody you have a prayer request <laughs> okay anyway it's just a, a sideline <laughs> but okay this is a serious moment okay God is asking you that question this morning because we've been calling talking for this fifth week we're talking about God's calling I've been called you've been called what are you asking the Lord this morning what would come out of your heart of course this morning you are listening to my sermon so you feel very spiritual <laughs> so if I ask you that question you will see more this a blessing uh, I want to serve you God okay because we are here in the church we hear this is the context we are being influenced by this and this spiritual influence okay what about Tuesday morning you had a bad day at work on Monday and this is Tuesday morning and God asked you that question what are you going to ask then hey <laughs> anyway just want to make you think about about that would it be something related to your calling to your service to God that would come first of course Jesus says ask for daily bread it's perfectly okay ask when you have something uh, broken hearts or ask for your needs this is perfectly okay but here this is something special that God is asking you would are you asking something about God's will for your life God's calling uh, what you could be doing on a daily basis the Lord Elisha without hesitation says I, I want I have something I want to ask you I, I want the Lord to give me a double portion of the spirit that is upon you wow that's something I would not have thought about it maybe I would say uh, I want to be like you but Elijah didn't say, I want to be like you, I want to be two times more than you. <laughs> That's pretty big. And Elijah says, well, uh, listen, Elijah, you're my friend, but you are asking a hard thing. It's quite hard. First of all, I was listening, uh, li studying that topic about the hard thing. Well, what is the hard thing about? First of all, El Elijah has no power to give that that's why it's a hard thing I, I have no power listen I you're asking me something that only God can give to you it's a hard thing uh, it's not in his authority it's not in his ability Elijah cannot do that and be careful when man takes you into meeting and they are going to impart to you their power okay because Elijah says, I'm sorry, it's not in me to impart a double spirit. Okay? So, but it is a hard thing because only God can do that. It's a spiritual gift that he is praying for. It's something supernatural. Only God can do it, first of all. Let's go to uh, the next point, the next scriptures, because I, I, I want to continue on that. Second King 2 Kings two eleven. As they were walking along and take talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire, and it drove between the two of them, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. 
Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, I see chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as it disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. When Elisha told Elisha in the previous text, you're asking a hard thing. He gave a sign. He didn't say it's impossible. He says, it's not in my power, it's hard. But here is, God gi is giving me a sign for you. If you see me, while I will be taken to heaven, it will be done to you. You will have what God asks you. Isn't that encouragement for you, that you can be bold in your prayers, and then God will speak to you and reveal to you what to do next. But if you don't see me, and about the hard things, what I have uh, studied from many Bible commentators is that it's about the vision of the horses. Okay, remember there were 50 pro prophets there? They are on the other side of the river. They're watching the scene. And Elijah struck the water. They cross on the other side. So Elijah, Elijah on the other side. And that little conversation, very intimate conversation, is taking place between them. If you see me while I'm taken over, it will be done for you. Okay, so now, what is the difference between what the prophet saw and what Elisha saw? The prophet didn't see the chariots of fire and the horses of fire. They saw Elijah taken in the whirlwind and disappearing, but he didn't see that. Elisha's spiritual eyesight was open. That is what I have studied on that topic. There was a supernatural moment here of vision. If you see me, then it will be done f for you. And he saw the vision. It's like Paul on the road to Damascus. He heard, he saw, the soldiers did not hear and saw the same thing. Something happened to him, a confirmation. He saw the, fa the fire, the horses of fire, the chariots of fire. The prophets didn't see that. They were actually didn't know what happened. The prophet has asked, and, and further uh, scriptures, later you will see, they asked Elisha after that, can give us permission and we will go. Maybe he's on, the Lord has moved him into another mountain. So they didn't see that moment where he's taken into heaven. They didn't see the vision, the supernatural, you know, the, 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 the spiritual uh, eyesight open to see in the, 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 the world to come. They didn't see that. But Elisha saw it, and it is a confirmation that it was given to him. So that's why it says, you are asking for hard things. If you see what God's going to do, then it will be a sign to you that God's going to grant it to you, the double portion. Imagine the double portion. Think about the portion that Elijah has. It's already a great portion. All of us would like to have even half of his portion. But now we're talking about double portion. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And then the last point, and we finish with that. Second King 2.13. Now, Elijah is taken to heaven. His cloak falls to the ground. Now, what's going to happen to that? Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he was taken up. Elijah returned to the bank of the river Jordan. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the, the river divided and Elisha went across. What a wonderful story it is when you think about that. It's too much. I'm still running out of time and I could continue with another message. But no, 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 no. I'm finishing today. Think of what it was like for Elisha to pick up that mantle. He's alone on the shore. All of this, imagine that that's big. Have you, uh, have you ever experienced something like that? This is an incredible event that just took place. Think of what's happening in his mind. What is he going to do? His mind is emotion. He's alone on the shore. This mantle did not fall from heaven on his shoulder. It fell on the ground. Is he going just to walk by? Continue? What is the significance of this mantle? Why did he pick it up? And then he, he, he tested. He tested whether he had received what he had prayed for. He had seen the, the, the vision. So he knew. So I believe he had enough faith now to grab that mantle and say, Lord, I, I want to 
go further with that. And faith, he picked up the mantle. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? If the Lord, God of Elijah, is with him, something's going to happen because he asked for it. Elijah is not there, but the God of Elijah is still there. And that's a great lesson for us as well. Whether you, especially for those of you who stepped in someone else's shoes. So someone of you will be called to specific ministries. You need to know that the God of Elijah, the, 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 the true God who created this world, is with you. So when he struck the water, it was divided. And he's, not only him, but the prophets recognize. And you see, it's not in my text here because I didn't want to go too far. But in verse 15, they saw that and they came and they bowed down before Elisha. They recognized that the spirit of Elijah, the transfer of the baton uh, took place here. Hudson Taylor said, before ever I go out to China, I must prove to myself the power of prayer. I cannot possibly go out there to serve the Lord unless I know that God answers prayer. And we, we find that over here. So in conclusion this morning, do you want to be in a position where the God of heaven will be using you for his glory in this world? God has called you, we said it, and you agreed with that. If God would ask you this question concerning your calling, ask what I shall do for you. Are you praying, God use me? God, I want more of you. I want to serve you more. Do you want like something big? Not necessarily a double portion because we have now the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to pray for a double portion. But we can pray for more. We can pray for more focus, more love, more service, more fruit, more effectiveness. Will you pick up the mantle this morning? I believe that the Holy Spirit today and through this series has spoken and challenged many of you today about your life, the significance, the meaningful, the fruitfulness of your life, the impact, what you have been before, how you feel you are right now. And the mantle is a symbol of the calling received. Remember the first, the first picture? This, the, the, the calling, as soon as Elijah put the mantle over his, his shoulder, you have a calling that takes place. He burns the wood, he kills the animals, and he serves him and he becomes his assistant. So the mantle has something, a, a big significance over here. It's also a sign that you accept. When you accept the mantle, when you pick up the mantle, it's also a sign that you accept to live under the authority of the Lord. I'm, I, I'm for Him now. Whatever I'm doing, wherever I am, I'm under His authority. And I accept, this is a sign also, the mantle, when you pick up the mantle, is a sign that you accept the responsibility. It's a great privilege, but it's a great responsibility that He entrusts to you. The mantle is also the symbol of the anointing, the enabling. What you cannot do, God will do. Can you show us the, the little uh, papayas uh, miracle here? <laughs> I saw this post of, on Facebook yesterday. And I said, well, I need to. This is Pastor Alejo. This is a great pastor and the Philippine friends of many of us here, mom and dad. He's been to Tagatai Conference many, many times Antique with his wife. Yeah, from the Antiki region. And he tells the story that uh, his wife planted a few seeds of papayas near the church by the side of the road where they are. And these papayas have grown so giant that when people p walk by the church on the side of the road, they stop they stare and they say, oh my God, <laughs> that, that's, that's what he says. And then he said, <laughs> and then he said, it inspired me that it is a miracle of hope. And says, now these papayas not only have become so big and so productive, but continue to bear more. And then he says, we are using these papayas in our feeding program. So I'm, I'm bringing it because like we call it the papaya revival. The Lord Almighty can make big things out of a small things as small as a papaya seed offered to Him. So you may f feel like, like the, 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 the small thing. But when you 
give it to God when you offer it to God, like with the, the mind and the, the heart and the spirit of Elisha. The big thing, leave it up to God. Uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can I sing a song in closing that you can sing with me as well? I seldom.